Kingdom Hearts is one of the most iconic video game franchises from the past 20 years. This strange crossover between Disney and Final Fantasy has spanned over multiple console generations and has captured the hearts of millions of players, myself included. While I didn't play the games right when they were released, I got into the franchise around 2015 while I was sampling a bunch of old PS2 games out of curiosity. Needless to say, I've been hooked ever since, and have been wanting to talk about these games on this channel for a very long time now. While the internet has no short of Kingdom Hearts discussions, I find that a lot of it is centered around how absurd the series can get, rather than a serious look at the content in question. I'm not pointing fingers here because, on surface level, Kingdom Hearts is very dumb. However, I don't think enough credit is given to the genuinely great aspects of these games. So for today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the first Kingdom Hearts, analyzing the highs and lows in order to figure out what makes this such a beloved title. There are a couple of things I want to say before we get started. Much like the Persona games, the Kingdom Hearts series has seen its fair share of updated re-releases. The final mix versions of the games feature tweaked combat, new bosses, and even some extra bits of lore, making them the definitive versions of the games. For the longest time, the final mix versions were exclusive to Japanese players, and it wasn't until the HD remasters when Western players would get their hands on them. While the vanilla versions of the games are still more than playable, final mix just adds too much to be ignored and should be the version you play. It should also go without saying that there are going to be stories spoilers in this video. I highly recommend you play the game yourself before watching, but I will give a warning before I talk about anything major in case you're not quite sure if this game is for you. With that out of the way, it's time we discuss why Kingdom Hearts is a lot smarter than you think. Our story begins on the Destiny Islands. We play as Sora, a young boy who along with his best friends Riku and Kairi, dreams of building a raft to explore other worlds. Riku in particular seems desperate to get off the island since he's sick of his day-to-day -day routine, and believes that their true purpose in life is waiting for them. That night, however, the island is invaded by these mysterious shadowy creatures. After avoiding the attackers, Sora manages to find Riku where he says that the door has been opened, and that this is their chance to go to another world. The boys are surrounded by darkness, and in a flash of light, Riku vanishes and Sora is granted this magical weapon known as the Keyblade. Sora eventually finds Kairi at their hidden hangout spot, but the two end up getting separated when Destiny Islands is consumed by the darkness. At the same time as this, we're introduced to Donald and Goofy, the royal guards of Disney castle. King Mickey has gone on a journey to discover the truth behind the sudden disappearances of other worlds. He tasks Donald and Goofy to go find someone known as the Key Bearer, as they're essential to solving this problem. When Sora comes to, he finds himself in Traverse Town, a place where people end up when their homes are destroyed. After running around for a bit, he eventually comes across Leon and Yuffie and is given a rundown on the situation. We learn that the creatures responsible for destroying worlds are known as the Heartless. Heartless feed off of the emotions of people, and when someone loses their heart, they too become a heartless. Every world has a heart of its own, and if the heartless manage to find the world's keyhole and consume the heart, the world will cease to exist. The only way to ensure this doesn't happen is for the Keyblade wielder to locate the keyhole and lock it up before the heartless can get to it. Since the Keyblade chose Sora, that duty has fallen onto him. It's immediately apparent that Sora doesn't want anything to do with this responsibility, and is more concerned about the safety of his friends. It isn't too long after this when Sora comes across Donald and Goofy while trying to defend the town from heartless. When when everything calms down, Donald and Goofy realize that Sora was the person that they're looking for. The duo invites the young boy to join their group so that they can take the gummy ship and travel the universe in search of King Mickey. Sora agrees to tag along since it's the best chance he has at finding his friends. And that's the basic setup for Kingdom Hearts. Sora, Donald, and Goofy have to travel the many Disney worlds to lock up the keyholes, beat the bad guys, and find their friends. It's a very simple story that takes advantage of both Square Enix's and Disney's strengths. The plot is inspired by a grand final fantasy style of narrative, but it's told in a way where kids can understand it. And just like with Disney's best films, the themes and morals are relevant for audiences of all ages. Kingdom Hearts does a great job at introducing the player to its characters and how the universe works. Every scene has a nice flow to it. The major players, their relationships, and character motivations are established swiftly and effectively. It isn't anything super complex, but the execution is pretty tightly knit. However, after this intro, the main narrative does take a bit of a backseat and becomes a pretty episodic affair. As the trio explores the many worlds, they'll find themselves getting involved with the plot of those Disney movies due to the ongoing threat of the Heartless. This is primarily an excuse for our party to interact with those iconic characters, and while these retellings can be seen as filler by some people, there's actually some underlying character development for our main protagonist. I have more I want to discuss regarding this subject, but I'm going to put a hold on that for now so we can cover the gameplay aspects first. The core gameplay in Kingdom Hearts can be divvied up into combat and exploration. 
ocean. While each of these aspects show their age in places, they both come together to form a nice whole. The combat mechanics of Kingdom Hearts is essentially what would happen if you were to directly translate the turn-based battle system of a classic Final Fantasy game into a 3D action RPG. You have your basic Keyblade Strikes, which are the bread and butter of the combat system, but over the course of the game, you'll gain access to new abilities to spice things up. Either that be through leveling up Sora through combat, or as a reward for doing optional content. Throughout the game, Sora slowly builds up a backlog of magic spells, and there's a healthy selection to choose from. There's your standard Fire, Blizzard, and Thunder magic, which act as you would expect, the ever-reliable Cure spell that you'll almost always have mapped to your shortcut menu, and more advanced magic, such as the Defensive Arrow spell, Percentage-based Area of Effect Gravity magic, and Time magic that can freeze your enemies in place. Just like the Final Fantasy games, there are multiple tiers of spells, and it's definitely worth it to maximize all of them. While not every spell is useful in every scenario, magic is a great way to level the playing field and deal with some of the more annoying Heartless in the game quickly. That's not all, because you also have Disney summons at your disposal. Summons temporarily replace your party members and have unique gimmicks for you to play around with. Symbol lets you charge up a roar that can wipe out a room depending on how much of the meter you fill. Genie has access to the same spells Sora does, but dishes them out in a random combo. And Dumbo just kinda sucks. My favorite summons in the game are Tinkerbell and Bambi, since they act as support rather than focus on offense. Tinkerbell provides passive healing, and can fully revive you once if you die. She also has the benefit of being the only summon to not get rid of your party members. Bambi is an absolute beast. He prances around the arena and drops tons of MP bubbles. This makes him the ideal summon for random encounters since you can just spam high level magic without having to worry about running out of MP. When it comes to what Sora can do in combat, that's honestly about it. The mechanics on offer here are actually very simple, and when compared to the later games in the series, it's definitely lacking. However, I wouldn't immediately write off the first Kingdom Hearts because of this. Limited mechanics don't make a game inherently bad, as long as the actual design takes advantage of what is there. For the most part, I think that Kingdom Hearts does accomplish this. There's a pretty decent selection of Heartless that you battle throughout the game. While it's true that a majority of them go down to Sora's basic attacks, there are some special case Heartless that require a little more thinking and forethought. The large bodies and the defenders, for example, need to be hit from behind as their fronts reflect attacks. The Sorcerer will teleport away after a combo and they're immune to most magic. Airborne enemies are best dealt with through the gravity spell since they bring them down to you. Another way the game encourages creative play is with the tech point system. Tech points are basically extra experience points that can be earned by performing certain actions in combat. For example, if you exploit the fire-based Red Nocturne Heartless weakness to ice, you'll be awarded tech points. One of the most common ways of earning tech points is by guarding or parrying an enemy instead of outright dodging their attack. You can earn tech points from almost every enemy in the game, so there's clearly an attempt at getting the player to stay creative. While I appreciate the idea, I don't think that the tech point system offers enough of a reward to stay relevant. In the early game, tech points are actually pretty useful since they can help you level up quicker, which means you'll unlock new abilities. However, the experience you gain from teching an enemy quickly falls behind how much you can earn from just defeating a Heartless the old-fashioned way. Not only is it faster to just wipe out all the Heartless in a room, but it's also far easier and gives you an overall better payout. There are abilities you can equip to Sora that increase the number of tech points you get, but it's not enough to really be worth it in my opinion. It's an alright system, but it's not enough for me to actively seek out how to tech certain enemies, and was just something that I would trigger on accident. It's a system that has more value to a first-time player since it's positive reinforcement for experimenting. But beyond that, I think that it could have been better executed. Maybe boost the overall experience gained, or just have more enemies with weaknesses to exploit. That way, instead of just getting experience, you'll also be doing bonus damage to enemies. Character customization in Kingdom Hearts is a large part of the experience. Every ability you learn through leveling up has to be equipped to Sora or his allies. These range from combo modifiers, special limit attacks, defensive options, and even passive abilities to help you restore MP. The catch is that each ability costs a certain amount of AP to equip. AP is pretty limited for most of the game, meaning that you'll have to be smart as to which abilities you decide to use in combat. I personally play very defensively, so most of my AP went towards skills like Leaf Bracer and Second Chance. There are a couple of limit breaks you can give Sora to help spice things up a bit, with Strike Raid being my personal favorite, since it does decent damage and gives you a lot of invincibility frames. Customization doesn't end here either, since your character's equipment is also important, with the most interesting being the different Keyblades you get access to. Keyblades are separated based on their stats, what special abilities they have, and their length. For the most part, Keyblade length is something you don't need to consider, but it actually does have a gameplay purpose. A long Keyblade will have a better attack range, but a slower swing speed and recovery time. Shorter Keyblades usually have a higher chance at landing critical hits, and are just faster in general. It isn't enough to be 
be a complete game changer, but some thought should go into which Keyblade you equip. And finally, there are the party members. Donald and Goofy will be by your side for most of the journey, and depending on the world, other Disney characters will also join your party. Since they're controlled by AI, you can customize their behavior to your liking. I personally use these party members as support since they don't do a whole lot of damage and are pretty fragile. I also usually stick to just using Donald and Goofy instead of the guest characters. Donald has access to all of the magic Sora has and can provide emergency healing when you properly set his parameters. Goofy gets access to MP Gift, a skill that lets him give his own MP to party members, making him a great replacement for Ethers later in the game. The other Disney characters are fine, but they lack enough abilities to make them worth replacing Donald or Goofy. Customization can change the way you approach a combat scenario, but at the end of the day, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay matters above all else. This is a very reactionary combat system. Sora doesn't have the most robust move set for you to play around with, so most of the game's depth and challenge comes from recognizing and reacting to enemy attacks. Finding that perfect opening to jump in and smack around Heartless while also dodging and blocking attacks is a pretty fun time. However, as time goes on, it becomes easier to notice the cracks. Sora is a bit clunky to control, and the camera is pulled in a bit too close to the action in some areas. It isn't enough to ruin the overall experience, but if you've played any of the later games in this series, it becomes much more apparent. However, combat is only half of the equation. Exploration and platforming are actually a large part of the gameplay experience. Each Disney World manages to have its own identity outside of its visuals. Olympus Coliseum features plenty of optional tournaments to fight in if you're wanting to level up or test your skills. Wonderland requires you to find evidence in order to prove Alice innocent, and Hundred Acre Wood is primarily focused on completing short mini-games. While the general goal in each world is to fight Heartless and lock up the keyhole, you almost always do so in a different way each time. However, not all of these gimmicks are created equally. I personally can't stand Atlantica. The swimming controls are perfectly fine, but the underwater combat combat isn't so great. This is mostly because this world strips you away from all of the unique abilities you've been collecting up until now. There's no proper dodge, you can't guard, and you're pretty much just stuck with the basic keyblade strikes and magic. The underwater gameplay is somewhat expanded on in Neverland. Airborne combat comes with the same caveats, but the difference is that you can alternate between staying on the ground with all of your normal abilities, or take to the skies at the press of a button. The best way to describe Atlantica would be slow or clumsy, and while I appreciate the attempt at something different here, I think that it highlights the overall stiffness of the game's combat system. I would say that this is my least favorite world in the game, but that honor would have to go to Deep Jungle. I find this world very confusing to navigate, and the game does a poor job at explaining where you're supposed to go to continue the story. Even if you do know where to go, you have to constantly go back and forth from the treehouse to the campsite, making this easily one of the most repetitive and boring stages. Other than those two glaring exceptions, I think that the level design stays at a very consistent quality. Kingdom Hearts and encourages you to explore these worlds from top to bottom due to how dense the areas are. Treasure is almost always awarded to the player for indulging in their sense of curiosity or through some tried and true platforming. However, I would be lying if I didn't acknowledge that Sora's controls are a bit on the stiff side. Platforming for most of the game lacks flow. Jumping doesn't give you a ton of distance and Sora stops in place for a split second after landing. This can lead to some awkward moments when trying to jump across small platforms. This does eventually become a non-issue once you unlock the glide ability after completing Neverland, but it doesn't excuse the problems you'll face for most of the journey. The platforming isn't terrible, but the controls and timing are something that you'll have to adapt to. Just like with the combat, the level design and exploration shows its age in a few areas. However, when you mix these two gameplay states together, it turns out surprisingly well. While it is a bit on the simplistic side, it never got boring for me because the game always introduced new types of enemies or experimented with the level structure. As I said, they're not all winners, but I find that a majority majority of the worlds are fulfilling and fun in their own ways. If you want more bang for your buck, there's plenty of optional content for you to sink your teeth into. I already mentioned this, but Olympus Coliseum has optional tournaments you can participate in throughout the game. Most of these are pretty easy, but they come with a few variants to keep things more interesting. Once you finish a tournament circuit once, you can enter again but with a handicap which will give you a new reward upon completing it. I find these tournaments a fun distraction, especially the Hades Cup, which is a 50 round gauntlet where you fight some of the hardest normal encounters in the game, along with some new boss battles. Some of my favorite parts of the Kingdom Hearts games has always been the optional bosses, primarily the ones you unlock near the end of the game. My feelings on the super bosses featured in KH1 are pretty mixed. There are a couple that I find a pretty good challenge and always require me to stay on my toes, such as Kurt Zisa, the iconic fight against Sephiroth, and this mysterious figure that appears in Hollow Bastion, but it also has its fair share of unremarkable ones, such as the Phantom and the Ice Titan. The reason why I'm not a fan of these bosses is because they
they move at a snail's pace. For the Phantom, the main gimmick is alternating between attacking his core with the correct attacks and casting stop magic on the clock so your party members don't die. What attacks you can damage the Phantom with cycles often, and there isn't much of a chance to do a lot of damage unless you're lucky. Even if you have the best equipment in the game, the fight drags on much longer than it should. The challenge comes from how much MP you have and the number of items that you bring into the battle. The Phantom's moveset is incredibly limited, and since you can only attack him during specific moments, this fight lacks any sort of depth outside of having to manage the Doom counter. The Ice Titan is an improvement, but it's not much better. It suffers from a lot of the same problems as the Phantom does. The main gimmick here is that you have to reflect the Icicle Barrage back at the Titan until he gets stunned. When that happens, you need to rush in and deal as much damage as possible before he gets back up. That's the entire strategy for this fight, and it's honestly pretty boring. While the Ice Titan has more attacks than the Phantom, I found him more annoying than difficult. The Ice Titan loves to throw out multiple attacks alongside his regular Icicle Barrage. You'll end up spending more time trying to avoid damage rather than knocking his Icicles back at him. The reason why this is a problem is that the entire pacing of the battle is dictated by whether or not the boss uses a specific attack. If we were to compare this fight to, let's say, Sephiroth, then the issue becomes more apparent. What makes this fight so great is that you're actively engaging in the boss at all times. There's little to no downtime since you're not only reacting to his wide variety of attacks, but you're also constantly taking advantage of his openings. The Ice Titan, on the other hand, only has one attack that you can retaliate against. The pacing of the fight is dictated by the game rather than the player's skill. As I said, it's a bit better than the Phantom fight, but that's mostly because you need proper timing to reflect his attacks. At the end of the day, it still suffers from a lot of the same problems. With all of this content considered, Kingdom Hearts definitely has a lot of meat on its bones. My playthrough for this video ended up taking me around 27 hours to finish. This includes all of the optional content, along with completing the Synthesis side quest to get the best gear in the game. The main story isn't terribly long, but I think that it's the perfect length for how simplistic some of the gameplay elements are. That covers the major gameplay facets, but there's one thing I've been leaving out since I wasn't too sure where to fit it in. Discovering new worlds in Kingdom Hearts requires you to fly your gummy ship and participate in these small shoot 'em up segments. These are pretty unnecessary and feel like they only exist to explain how Sora and his friends find other worlds. In terms of how they actually play, it's a very simplified version of Star Fox. The goal is to blast away everything in your sights until you reach the end of the stage. They don't last too long, but I find the sudden shift in gameplay styles very jarring, especially since they don't have the same grace or appeal as the main combat does. Something that I do like about the gummy ship is that it's fully customizable. You can build pretty much anything you want, the only limit is your imagination and your supply of gummy blocks. My ship was called the Sub 2 Aqua. Link in the description! If you can't tell, I definitely prioritized function over form. The gummy ship sections do become more fun once you start to trick out your ship with some of the better upgrades. However, I still struggle to call them anything better than decent. The gummy ship is only mandatory during a world's first visit, since you do unlock the ability to fast travel between any discovered worlds around halfway through the game. While I'm not a huge fan of its gameplay, I actually do enjoy the sense of discovery that the gummy ship provides. On a first time playthrough, you're not sure which Disney worlds you're going to explore in what order. So while flying the gummy ship, there's this feeling of anticipation building up over the course of the stage, until the big reveal near the end. KH1 is the only game that does this, and the other games just flat out tell you which world you're going to be traveling to ahead of time. While the later games do have superior gummy ship sections, I can't help but feel as though the sense of adventure and discovery was lost in some way. When looking at the gameplay as a whole, it's easy to tell where it's aged. The combat isn't incredibly deep, and some of the platforming can feel very sticky and awkward. But for the sum of its parts, Kingdom Hearts manages to craft a unique gameplay experience out of these ideas, one that I personally think holds up rather well, even if it is unimpressive when compared to some of the later entries. With all of the gameplay stuff out of the way, all that's left for me to cover is the rest of the game's story. As a reminder, I'm going to be dishing out spoilers throughout the rest of the video, so if what you've seen has interested you, then I recommend you play the game yourself before watching the rest. With that out of the way, let's go into a bit more detail as to what's going on here. As I mentioned earlier in the video, the main motivation behind the story is relatively simple. Sora, Donald, and Goofy travel the many worlds in search of their friends. Behind the scenes, however, a more devilish plot is being hatched by Maleficent and her band of Disney villains. They have the goal of kidnapping the seven princesses of heart so that Maleficent can unlock the final keyhole in Hollow Bastion and obtain immense power. It's because of them that the Heartless have been spreading to the many different Disney worlds, so Sora and his friends need to clean up their mess along the way. Not too long into the journey, Sora and his new friends actually run into Riku at Traverse Town, but it's quickly revealed that he's slowly being manipulated by Maleficent. It turns out that Riku has actually found Kairi, but her heart is currently lost. This has her left in a zombified state, and Riku is willing to do anything it takes to save Kairi. 
Maleficent takes full advantage of this and convinces the young boy to use the power of darkness to accomplish this goal, all the while planting the idea in Riku's head that Sora has replaced him and Kairi with Donald and Goofy. While both boys want to ensure the safety of Kairi, they have different methods of doing so. Riku is willing to exploit and take advantage of others to accomplish his goals, while Sora is the exact opposite. This naturally puts the two at odds with each other, and they clash a couple of times throughout the story. The conflict between Sora and Riku is a driving force throughout the main plot. Not only is this supposed to highlight how Riku's slowly becoming corrupted by the darkness, but it's also supposed to show how Sora learns and grows throughout the journey. It's a very important part of the narrative, but the execution of this is serviceable at best. This is because the foundation of this conflict is built off of an underdeveloped relationship between two characters. During the opening hours, the game attempts to show us what the friendship between Sora and Riku is like. They're childhood best friends, both have ambitions of exploring worlds outside of their home, and have a friendly rivalry with each other. However, beyond on these introductory points, we're not given any more time to have their relationship explored before they're ripped apart. The next time we see Riku, Maleficent has already begun to wrap her fingers around the young boy. This makes a lot of the drama between Sora and Riku feel superficial at best. We're supposed to feel bad for what's happening between these two characters, but that's only because we're told that they're best friends instead of having this conveyed through meaningful character interaction. With the way the story is structured now, it would be very difficult to include more scenes between the two characters prior to Riku's side with Maleficent, so I think that Sora possibly meeting Riku in Traverse Town earlier in the story could help mend this. I don't want to propose too many rewrites because there's plenty of aspects to appreciate with the way the story is structured now. A common piece of criticism towards Kingdom Hearts is that the Disney worlds themselves are nothing but filler and don't advance the plot in any meaningful ways. For the most part, this is true. When looking at the Disney worlds individually, they seem to be glorified recaps of the films they're based on with only a few new ideas sprinkled in. However, when you take a step back back and look at the full picture, you'll see that these seemingly disconnected visits are actually in service of developing Sora and his relationships. Deep Jungle puts Sora and his friends at odds with each other since their goals don't line up, and it takes until the end of that world for them to finally make up and learn how to work as a team. Atlantica establishes the concept of meddling, and how just by being there, Sora is disrupting the natural order since the worlds are supposed to be separated. The Disney worlds feel more than just retellings of the movie's plots because the specific stories chosen are altered to fit the overall overall narrative of Kingdom Hearts. The lessons that can be taught to the audience from these films end up having an impact on Sora as a character. We get to see him learn the value of having strong relationships with others and that you should always believe in yourself. This is highlighted perfectly in the penultimate world, Hollow Bastion. When confronting Riku during your first arrival, it's revealed that he was the true Keyblade wielder the entire time, and Sora was just the delivery boy. Not only does Sora lose his weapon, but Donald and Goofy end up abandoning him too in order to stay loyal to King Mickey. This feeling of helplessness is hammered in through gameplay as you're near defenseless against the high-leveled Heartless in the area. You have to rely on beasts to deal damage for you since your wooden sword can't hurt the enemies. Sora does eventually come across Riku again, but ends up standing his ground when Donald and Goofy decide to rejoin him. While by himself, Sora can't make a difference. He's learned throughout his journey the value of depending on others. Through the hardships, Sora has grown closer to his friends and forged new bonds along the way. Every single one of them is with him in spirit, and because of that, Sora has the strength to stand up against the darkness and reclaim the Keyblade for himself. Is it cheesy? Of course it is. But Kingdom Hearts is very earnest with its themes. The idea that we can accomplish anything as long as we have people supporting us isn't original or complex by any means, but the way the game portrays this message is done well. There was a good amount of time spent building up this moment through the other Disney worlds, which is why I can't fully agree with the criticism laid against them. I'm not saying that the story structure and theming is high art that only the most refined critics can enjoy, I'm more so suggesting that there's a lot to appreciate when looking at events from a different angle. I will admit, not every Disney world is created equal in what value it brings to the original story of Kingdom Hearts, but I find it pretty unfair to say that most Disney worlds are filler when that's definitely not the case. At least, that's how I feel about it. However, that's not the only message that the game conveys to the player. While the power of friendship is a very prominent theme throughout the story, ultimately, Kingdom Hearts is a coming-of-age story, and this idea is something that I don't see talked about all too much. While I mentioned that the relationship between Sora and Riku could have used more work, it's their roles in the story that highlights this theme of what it's like to grow up. Riku believes that the world outside of his home has much more to offer. He's desperate to leave his childhood behind and venture into the unknown. This recklessness 
happiness and desire to grow up causes Riku to be manipulated by the people around him. He is used for their own personal gain and is led down a dark path, but is too naive to understand this. By the end of the game, Riku's childhood is stolen from him by the true antagonist, Ansem. Ansem was a scientist who was researching the nature of hearts and darkness before discovering a way to create artificial heartless. He lost his body during these experiments and takes advantage of a vulnerable Riku to gain a physical form. Ansem's plan is to gain access to Kingdom Hearts, the source of all hearts and an unlimited source of darkness. Riku's downfall is meant to teach audiences that the real world isn't forgiving and that there are many selfish people that will use you for personal gain. Riku believed that he knew much more about the world than he actually did, and because of that naivety, he was ripe to be taken advantage of. Sora, on the other hand, is meant to teach audiences to cherish their childhoods. The Disney worlds are meant to serve as a metaphor for nostalgic memories. Each world is based on a film that resonates with us on a personal level, and it's comforting to be able to relive those experiences. The final worlds, however, have this dark and melancholic feel to them. By the time we reach the final stage, the end of the world, the Disney worlds are nothing more than just childhood memories that we carry on into the unknown. It's those experiences and lessons that shape us into who we are today. While the road ahead is bumpy and filled with uncertainty, we can rely on our close connections to pick us up when needed. This is the core of the story. It's not just about learning to rely on others, but it's also trying to teach us to cherish our childhoods. It's because of this that Sora and his friends are able to overcome the trials and defeat Ansem. Thanks to the assistance of a returning Riku and King Mickey, the door to Kingdom Hearts is able to be sealed and the worlds destroyed by the Heartless are restored. A consequence to this, however, is that Sora is once again separated from his friends. Instead of returning to Destiny Islands with Kairi, Sora decides to venture off with Donald and Goofy to find their friends, promising that one day, they'll return home. Sometime later, the group finds themselves wandering around this grassy field before coming across Pluto the dog. While the future may be unknown for the trio, their unwavering optimism gives them the strength to continue forward. And that's the end of Kingdom Hearts. If you can't tell, I really like this game. It's impossible to deny that there are aspects of Kingdom Hearts that have aged. This is most noticeable in the gameplay side of things, since mechanically speaking, things are a bit bare, the platforming is pretty stiff, and not every world is a winner in terms of concept and execution. But more often than not, I believe that Kingdom Hearts delivers a satisfying gameplay experience thanks to how much content and customization there is. Simplicity isn't always a bad thing, as long as the subject in question takes advantage of everything it has to offer. Kingdom Hearts manages to accomplish this on both a gameplay and a narrative level. While the story isn't super deep, it acts as a perfect origin for these characters, while also doing a great job at expressing its themes. I'm not trying to claim that Kingdom Hearts is a flawless story, but there's a lot more to appreciate when looking at things from a different perspective. While there are some awkward aspects to the way the story is told, it's the overall themes and message that are being conveyed that resonate with myself and many others on such a personal level. It's easy to point and laugh at the dumb things Kingdom Hearts does, but it somehow takes this very strange premise and makes something truly special out of it. It perfectly captures why people love both of these franchises, and while the execution isn't free from criticism, there's much more to appreciate at the end of the day. I hope that I've inspired anyone who isn't totally familiar with the franchise to try it out for themselves, or if you are someone who's played the games, then maybe I've given you a new perspective. Is Kingdom Hearts an incredibly cheesy game that has some awkward dialogue, weird voice acting, and just an outright ridiculous concept? Yes. But it's also much more mature and smarter than people give it credit for, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I'd like to give a special shout out to all of my channel supporters whose names are on screen now. It's because of these lovely people that I'm able to make videos at the pace I do currently. These videos take a while to make, so if you're at all interested in helping out and donating, you can do so through my Patreon or channel memberships. I have a few things I can offer in return, such as early video access, a special Discord role, and even some behind the scenes content on occasion. Every donation helps, and if these rewards at all sound interesting to you, then you can find out more by following the links in the description. The next video is going to be on Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse. I know it's a bit of a tonal whiplash to Disney, but I've been getting a lot of requests to cover this game, especially after the SMT4 video, which ended up getting quite a bit of attention. I'm not too sure when I'll be able to have 
have it finished by, but I want it out before the end of September. If you want to stay up to date with that in future projects, then I suggest you follow my Twitter or join my Discord server. Both links will be in the description. And if you're new here and like what you've seen so far, I suggest that you subscribe to the channel since this won't be the last time we talk about Kingdom Hearts around here. I've also got plenty of other videos that might pique your interest as well. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you all next time.